okay in the uh, last uh, few lectures we had been uh, seeing dc bridge circuits so we had used the wheatstone's bridge kevin's bridge <coughs> and also circuits like the mega circuit for measurement of high value resistances and uh, in the next few lectures we will look into ac bridge circuits uh, where uh, instead of resistances we will look at the other types of impedances measurement yeah, and more particularly in this particular lecture we would look into capacitance measurement okay now in ac bridge circuit as the name implies we are look, uh, looking into using ac signals and uh, trying to figure out trying to measure the value of a circuit component and we will look into capacitors and inductors that is we will measure the capacitance of a capacitor and in case of inductance either the self inductance or the mutual inductance between a pair of inductors okay and we'll also uh, try to figure out the quality of a capacitor or an inductor by measuring the quality factor in case of an inductor or dissipation factor in case of a capacitor okay uh, let's first go into the basic concept of an ac bridge okay so this the construction of ac bridge is very much similar to the construction of wheatstone's bridge uh, so in similar to the dc bridge like wheatstone's bridge the ac bridge also has four arms and you have a detector connected across this arms okay and uh, however in instead of uh, them the arms being simple resistances now there are uh, four impedances here z1 z2 z3 z4 uh, one of those impedances is the unknown impedance okay and uh, instead of a dc supply you have an ac supply okay uh, but there is one very important difference okay uh, that is the nature of the signal across these two terminals this terminals across which the detector is to be connected in dc bridge circuit we had a galvanometer connected here and the current was being measured and we wanted the current to go to zero okay uh, however when you so that so, so you had a dc signal there and the dc signal being equal to zero uh, meant that the bridge was in balanced condition however when you have an ac supply regardless of which points you take okay even this the voltage across this point okay let us see if this is one and this is one dash v11 one, one dash is an ac signal okay which would mean that it is a signal like this and if we use a galvanometer then the galvanometer would indicate the mean reading okay this is under the assumption that the frequency is uh, much greater than the response speed of the galvanometer okay but that is usually the case your galvanometer cannot your supply frequency is sometimes it is 50 hertz sometimes it is much greater than 50 hertz also if you have an audio signal here okay so you can assume that the minimum frequency that you can expect the ac supply to have is about 50 hertz however your galvanometer is not a device that can oscillate at a speed that is greater than 50 hertz nor is the observer such a person who can track whether the galvanometer is oscillating at 50 hertz or the galvanometer is staying at zero 
okay so what it boils down is that if you have a sign if you have an ac signal and you connect a galvanometer across the bridge the reading of the galvanometer will be zero or the reading will be at least perceived at zero okay and what this boils down is that in case of an ac bridge circuit your galvanometer is not going to suffice as a detector you need to do something that will uh, help in capturing the sine wave and, and differentiating between a sine wave and a uh, and a signal v equal to zero okay so for this purpose the detector that is to be used is something like an oscilloscope or a headphone or an ac null bridge null detector something that can read a sine wave as such okay and similar to the case of a dc bridge you need the you need a particular uh, relationship between these impedances z1 z2 z3 and z4 at the balance condition okay you need i a z1 to be equal to i b z2 and i a z3 to be equal to i b z4 so from that you can see that z1 z4 is z2 z3 if you go for the impedances or y1 y4 is y2 y3 if you go for the admittances okay or z1 by z2 z3 z3 by z4 all those cases can be taken into consideration okay and this brings to one more important conclusion okay in case of a wheatstone's bridge you had a relationship like r1 r4 is r2 r3 okay so what you are doing is you are comparing two real numbers and to achieve a balance you had one adjustable component that would suffice so if you had if you had r1 and r2 are, are the ratio arms they are constant r4 is unknown okay r3 can be variable and the job gets done however in case of a ac circuit you are basically combine uh, comparing two complex numbers so z1 z4 would be a complex number because z1 and z4 z2 and z3 can now be impedances and since you are comparing two complex numbers you needed you would need the two adjustable components to hope that the uh, that a null condition a balance condition can be achieved okay so we need two either a variable resist two variable resistors one variable resistor one variable capacitor something of this combination would be required okay and as i said earlier in this particular lecture we would look into capacitance measurement and also the calculation of the dissipation factor for a capacitor using the bridge circuit okay and since the capacitor measurement and <coughs> we will be using rc bridges for this capacitance measurement more particularly we will look into the construction of two uh, particular bridge circuit the desorte bridge and the sharing bridge the desorte bridge is being used for low dissipation factor capacitances and the sharing bridge for high dissipation factor capacitances okay now the next question that can crop up is what do you mean by this dissipation factor let's look into that now okay now the dissipation factor or is a is a number that indicates the quality of the capacitor it is basically the ratio of the resistive part to the reactive part of the capacitor's independent uh, uh, impedance okay so if the capacitor is z is equal to r minus 
jx okay the ratio r by x is going to be the uh, quality factor of the uh, sorry the dissipation factor of the capacitor okay and uh, basically you don't want this r component to exist okay you only want the jx component to exist so which would mean that as d increases your capacitor is actually going more towards uh, imperfection it is there is more leakage so why is it called leakage let's uh, look at the two different uh, configurations in which you can imagine a capacitor an imperfect capacitor and uh, then address the point of what this leakage would mean okay one thing is that you can assume that the capacitor is in series the you the capacitor the practical capacitor is actually an ideal capacitor with the capacitance cx in series with a small value so you have a capacitance cx here and you have a small valued a small resistor rs in series with this capacitance okay and now the dissipation factor is the ratio of r by x okay so the cap the actually z is rs plus 1 by j omega cx okay so this would mean that the dissipation factor is omega rs cx okay and uh, now the leakage is that when there is a current that is flowing through this there you would have i square rs loss and this is the leakage that is happening in the series configuration of a capacitor okay and uh, similarly you can also imagine that the capacitance is actually a shunt of a resistance and a ideal capacitance again you have a cx here and you have a shunt resistance uh, r sh okay now whether whenever there is a voltage drop across this okay in case of a non-ideal capacitor there is some current flowing through this and that is causing the leakage so in this case r sh is a large resistance okay something a resistance in the mega ohm or a giga ohm range okay that would provide an alternate path for the current okay uh, other than the current uh, through the capacitor okay so one thing is to be assume uh, is to be remembered that when you assume that the capacitor is the uh, practical capacitor is uh, modeled as a series combination you are assuming that rs is small and when it is assumed as a parallel combination you assume that the shunt capacitance rsh is a large value capacitance okay and um, in both cases when r the resistance r comes to some mid range okay it means that the dissipation is increasing so when rsh decreases dissipation increases here when rs increases dissipation increases so th this is the this is the point that we need to remember when we are uh, dealing with these either the rc series or is rc shunt case and depending upon the case we have to remember it properly okay now let's look into the desorti bridge let's look at the really ideal case let's forget that there was there is dissipation or anything okay now <coughs> we want to measure the capacitance of this unknown capacitor cx okay and to do this we use something that is very very similar to the Wheatstone's bridge circuit okay we have r3 and r4 here in similar to the Wheatstone's bridge and z1 is now a pure capacitor an ideal capacitor zero loss capacitor okay now the balancing at balance okay what you have to what you would uh, get is that z1 z4 is z2 z3 
and when on new balance you can very easily get the value of the unknown resistors as something that is linearly dependent at the scaled version of the known ideal capacitor c1 okay but as the name implies this ideal capacitance is not going to exist but practical capacitance always has some amount of leakage okay okay so the dissipation is seldom going to be zero so what we would do is that we will not only assume that the capacitances here and the capacitances here are non-zero will also add a series resistance in both of these arms okay note that r1 this capital r1 and capital rs okay are explicit series resistances okay they are not the resistances that are modeled inside the capacitor okay and we also assume that these capacitances are uh, practical, they are non-ideal and they have an internal series resistance R1 and Rs. Okay. Now let us look at the situation where the circuit is balanced. So at the balance, okay, R4 times Z1 is R3 times Z2 that is being written here. And when you separate out the real and imaginary part and balance them out, you get the value of Rx and Rs, the series uh, uh, internal resistance Rs, small Rs, and the capacitance value Cx. Okay. And you also get the dissipation factor Dx. Okay. Uh, now, the only problem here is that this expression is quite complicated one okay and it requires the pre-computation of or it requires the knowledge explicit knowledge of what is this r1 the internal resistance of the capacitor which may not be really available okay generally in most cases, what you are interested in is not explicitly this Rs, you are interested in the Cx and this Dx. Okay, You are interested in the capacitance and the dissipation factor, not so much the series resistance. Okay, So, what we want is we want less clutter in the expressions of Cx and Dx. You the expression of Cx is anyway, it's clean. What about the expression of Dx? Here you have R1. So is there a way to sort of make it simpler? You are using another <coughs> non-ideal capacitance C1 here. So you know C1 and we assume that we also know the dissipation factor of C1. So D1 is omega C1 R1. R1 is, we are not really trying to measure okay however when comparing dx and d1 we can get dx minus d1 the difference between these two is going to be this expression now this is actually dependent on on only uh, these external elements so it is it is dependent on rs which you have connected here it is dependent on r3 and r4 which again are connected separately it is dependent on this r1 value which is again connected separately okay so this is easier to uh, compute rather than trying to figure out with what is the configuration of c1 and what is this r1 okay i hope that clarifies so you are only interested in this thing not so much on this okay now, since we have a uh, series disorder bridge, you also have a alternate form, the parallel disorder bridge, the parallel RC disorder bridge. Okay, this is generally used when the capacitor is a little more lossy okay, than in compare than the series disorder bridge. Okay, again, 
now here you assume that the capacitances are modeled as a parallel combination so here this is the unknown capacity unknown uh, capacitance unknown capacitor okay and on the z1 branch you are you have a known capacitance which is modeled as a parallel combination okay this should be rsh Oh, sorry this is r1 okay this is r s h okay so again at balance we have this expression z1 z4 by zx is z3 by z1 which can be written like this these are the admittances because it's a parallel <coughs> circuit the admittances get added up Okay, and on simplification, you can find the value of RSH, CX, and DX. Again, um, we are not too interested in complicating and finding the value of RSH. Okay, so DX is the um, CX is again has a quite a decluttered uh, this thing, and DX, the dissipation factor of the capacitance, is now a um, what do you call? <laughs> a multiple of the dissipation factor of the known capacitance c1 okay uh, however there is one slight issue here okay or not an issue here something that needs some amount of observation you see that dx is always greater than d1 because see r1 is greater than 0 always you don't okay you don't have a situation where r1 is a small quantity or 0 okay dx is always greater than d1 so which would mean that the dissipation factor of the unknown capacitance has to be greater than the dissipation factor of a of the known capacitance c1 okay or rather in the other way around c1 d1 should be less than expected dx okay you need a you would need a good quality a low dissipation factor capacitance to be used in this circuit or else uh, you would not achieve this balance okay note that only at balance you can have this condition okay so if you have a lossy capacitor here okay and not so lossy capacitor in the unknown tranche then you would not achieve balance at all okay so there is a demand of a less dissipation dissipative uh, capacitance here okay now there is uh, one thing that in both the series and shunt case okay if the <coughs> we already seen that if it is a shunt case okay even in the shunt case r1 plus r1 by r1 is happening so if as the dissipation factor increases the shunt resistance r1 okay if it goes down okay then you would have the dx to be the same as d1 so the accuracy is lost similarly in the series case also okay if rsh increases then to the accuracy in determining the dissipation factor gets lost and so these errors to avoid these errors a slight change in the configuration is needed and in case you are dealing with lossy capacitors with larger dissipation factors okay we tend to use the sharing bridge in place of the desorte bridge okay so the sharing bridge configuration is very similar to the <coughs> series uh, desorte bridge okay so this rx or the zx branch is the same okay 
you have the unknown capacitance here in the zx branch okay instead and here you have a uh, low dissipation factor capacitance c1 okay there is no other series component here in z1 arm it's only one okay in Z3 arm, instead of R3 alone, you have a parallel combination of C3 and R3. Okay, and from this, at balance, you can say that using the equation, you can determine what is the value of uh, RS and what is the value of CX. Okay, now. And now if you did if you find the dissipation factor this dissipation factor is would be dependent only on at balance it would depend upon only the c3 and r3 values okay and if we keep r3 as constant and vary c3 or the other way around also okay if you keep one of these factors constant vary the other one you would end up uh, as a you can you can use one of them say say you say that r3 is constant and c3 is varying so c3 the value of c3 is becomes direct a direct creating a direct indication of the dissipation factor d okay and which means that the d can be d reading can be taken directly okay and uh, there are other there are few other applications in which the sharing bridge can be used one of them is for insulation testing okay now here you have an insulator which is modeled again as a capacitance in series with an induct uh, with a resistance okay and that is being tested so insulator is kept here a high value direct capacitor is kept here okay in c2 branch and similarly you have a capacitance induct a capacitance and a resistance here and the other branch is a pr capacitance okay. and since a high voltage uh, application it's a high voltage application only if you apply a high value of voltage across this since the capacitance and resistances of this circuit is quite high of C1 R1 is quite high even to produce a very low value of current across this D you need a high value of voltage okay what boils down what it boils down to is that if you compare the voltages the voltages across this this terminal B C okay let me use a different color so that it is okay voltage across this b and c terminal or d and c terminals okay these ones are much much less than the voltage across these two terminals and these two terminals so this entire the detector circuit is generally protected against the effects of this high voltage okay simply because of the high impedance of these two branches okay and from this you can Com uh, compute the value of this capacitance of the of the insulation material okay and as an additional protection this uh, end is also grounded okay it's also it was already grounded here anyway okay another application in which the sharing bridge can be used is to uh, compute relative permittivity of some material okay so what is done is that you create a capacitor with the dielectric material being the material under test so this whatever i'm coloring in green okay this will be the material under test okay and you do two capacitance measurements you measure you keep the switch open okay and measure the capacitance 
you keep the switch closed and measure the capacitance okay when you keep the so let's say that if this is cx1 if this is cx2 okay when it is open then cx open would be just cx1 okay and when it is closed then cx closed is the summation of these two capacitances that is quite trivial to see okay so you can uh, get the value of this capacitance alone as the difference of the value of the unknown capacitance when the switch is closed and the, when the switch is open okay and uh, since the formula for the capacitance is cx is uh, epsilon a by d and epsilon is the relative permeability into the absolute permeability permittivity sorry. then from this you can figure out what is the relative permittivity of whatever material that we are dealing with Okay. And another application in which RC bridge circuits can be used is the Wien bridge, which is generally used for frequency measurement. Okay. This is the structure of the Wien's bridge. And uh, now at balance, you have this relationship. And if you look at the imaginary part, if you see the real part, the real part uh, becomes independent of frequency. Okay. And at the and the imaginary part, when you try to equate, you find an expression of frequency in terms of the elements of the bridge circuit. Okay, and from that you can determine what is the supply frequency. Okay, so with that we come to the end of this lecture. You can <coughs> look into chapter sixteen of AK Sony, which deals with the AC bridge circuits and also chapter 5 in Helfrich and Cooper which again deals with the bridges and their applications okay uh, okay thank you for your time we'll end the lecture here